Hello friends, thank you for being here and tuning in. We're going to continue our CBF Presents and today's guest artist and a good friend of mine, her name is Sarah, also known as The Mint Gardener, and she's an amazing watercolor teacher and an artist as well. She is from Seattle, Washington and I'm so excited to have her on board. If you'd like to learn more about her, I'll link her page down below in the description as well as all the materials she's going to be using in this lesson. Also if you do recreate this piece, please be sure to use hashtag color by Felix so that we can see your recreation and share them with my community. All right, guys, enjoy this lesson and be sure to like and subscribe to stay tuned for more. I'm Sarah Simon, the Mint Gardener, and today I'm going to be teaching you how to paint with watercolor. To begin a watercolor wash, a lot of people ask me how much water goes on my paper, how much water is actually in my paintbrush, and how much water is on my palette. And really, the secret to creating a beautiful watercolor piece is starting with your palette. You need to make your magic sauce on your palette before it ever touches your paper. I found as I've been teaching my classes over the last couple of years, people enjoy analogies, especially when it comes to doing something maybe a little bit uncomfortable or foreign. If holding a paintbrush doesn't feel natural for you yet, um, I know most people eat. So my analogies are usually revolve around food. I love to eat. I don't cook, but I love to eat. So um, what I've learned is uh, we are gonna make some magic sauce on our palate. And my analogy with food is actually a soy sauce with wasabi. So it's really the amount, getting the right amount of water from your mason jar onto your palate. And that's where the magic begins, is on your palate. Okay, and so the consistency that we're looking for, we're gonna be looking for, we're gonna bring water over to our palettes and the consistency we're gonna be creating is a soy sauce with a touch of wasabi. If you imagine the dried paint on your palette that's already here, um, this is like a dried tube paint or you could use your cakes, your dried cake paint. Um, if you imagine this is your wasabi, the water you're bringing to it is soy sauce. So if the soy sauce wasabi thing still feels confusing, you can imagine it's about 80% water, 20% paint. Um, so we're gonna bring enough water over to our palettes that if you were to take your palette and tip it one side to another, small raindrops would start to form and slide down the plate. And that's the wet consistency that we want on the palette that we will then make our magic sauce that then goes to your, or to your paper. Um, so to begin, we have to engage our paint brushes. So if you have a brand new paint brush, which all of my lovely ladies here do, you can go ahead and remove the protective cap. Some people really like to keep this cap so that they can then transport their paint brush home or you know wherever they'd like to go. I also have used cup holders to store my paint brushes straight up, works great. The reason you care about your paint brush point is because that really gives you that agility to get a fine stroke. So protecting the point of your brush is important. You never want to leave your paintbrush, just paintbrush care, you never want to leave your paintbrush in the water like this. Your, the little point on the end starts to form to the sides of your mason jar and you'll be really bummed because it's a lot harder to paint with when it's starting to curve off on its own. I like to hold it in a classic hold, which is just simply how you would hold a pen. All right, so if you were to pass it to a friend and then when it comes back into your hand where it naturally falls, that's gonna be your best way. Um, most brushes have a bulb. Usually you wanna hold on to the bulb of your brush. So it's right behind the metal ferrule on the bulb of your brush. This gives you the most control However, scooching down, if that's a little bit more comfortable for you, is totally acceptable and can give you a little bit more accessibility for her for, for when you're making your finer lines, okay? okay so that's how you hold it. Um, to prime your brush, once you've got it in your hand and the paint cap off, so this is what I'm, this guy doesn't have any water in it. This is what I'm doing with my brush. I'm actually scraping it against the bottom back and forth. You never go straight down, right? Because you really do want to preserve the point of your brush. But working from side to side engages the paintbrush and allows water to soak up the bristles into the handle and really get your paintbrush primed full of water and ready to paint. So once your paintbrush is engaged, you're going to take it and go back to your palette 
three or four times. So the actual practical, what we're going to be doing, the actual strokes that we're going to be doing is paintbrush to water to palette, engage in one of your colors, and then back to water and back to your palette. So you're bringing that water straight to your palette. It feels very foreign, I know, to bring water away from a jar and into something dry, but that's how we're gonna start. And remember what we're going for. We want that soy sauce and wasabi texture. So we want, we want the water to be running and moving. We want that movement and shine, all right? So if you were to, I'll borrow this from you, Samantha. If you were to take your plate, your palette again, and move it around, you want those raindrops to form. So we'll get some water on our palettes and I'll show you what we want. So here we have a completely dry palette. All right, so we're gonna follow that same technique. So I'm gonna engage my paintbrush and get water over here. And you can see I'm not being timid about this. I'm really getting in there, I'm stirring it up, I'm engaging the bristles all the way down to the ferrule, pressing down fully with full pressure so that I can really start to get some movement. I think that was four times I went back and forth. So now, as you can see, you see those raindrops coming down? So we have a nice we have a nice amount of water that's moving on the palette. This is gonna be a constant renegotiation with water. So every time you're introducing a new color, even while you're using the same color as you're painting, you're gonna be constantly going back to your palette to make sure that your magic sauce has that watercolor wasabi movement so that when you bring this to your paper, there is that movement beforehand. That, that enables your paint to actually move on your paper in a lovely way. And I've been asked, um, good question, why don't I just use an eyedropper or, you know, just cheat a little bit, throw a little bit of water on here? And you absolutely can, especially if you're painting a really large piece. But for us today, we're not painting very large pieces. They're all going to be on the eight and a half by 11. And also, if you introduce too much water to your pigment, to your paints, you can water them down much quicker. So by slowly introducing water and kind of waking up each color as you go, you enable the paints to stay more solid longer and keeping them to that true pigment less muddy quicker. So once you feel like you have that 80% water, 20% paint, you've got some nice movement on your plate, you're ready to start painting a watercolor wash. So a watercolor wash is simply a translucent layer of color on your paper. Let me show you some examples of some really lovely washes we've done. All right, these are different washes, different layered washes. Here's some more washes and here's some more. And what we're going to be doing with the class today is actually three different boxes. The wash, the wet and wet, and then a graded wash. So for our, our audience at home, when you guys are wanting to do this, all you need to do is um, get a watercolor piece of paper. So remember, 140 pound weight, cold press, and you're going to draw three boxes. And then you can label them a wash, wet and wet, and a graded wash so that you can access that later, okay? So that's what we're gonna be creating today in those three spaces. Here's my nice blank one. This is what you guys can emulate at home and then add wash, a wet and wet and a graded wash. So the steps for a watercolor wash, again, it's a translucent layer of color on your paper. So you're going to engage your brush, it's already wet. You're gonna soak in some water. Then you're gonna to go to your magic sauce that you've just created that has a lot of that movement and shine, and shine is when you do this. See that reflection, the light? All right, movement and shine, and left to right strokes across your paper, back and forth, until the paper starts to kind of show up between the paint. Then you're gonna go wash, or you're gonna go your water, your paint, your magic sauce, and then back, to your same watercolor wash, and then your next strokes are all going to be water. To fill up your box, you're going to 
again, be just adding more and more water. So again, those, those steps were paintbrush to sauce to paper, paintbrush to, to water to sauce to paper, and then water. And what you learn quickly with watercolor is it all, your paint will move to where your water is. Your water quickly becomes the boundary where your paint will move. So as you are creating this wash, notice to smooth lines, you add more water. Water is your boundary. So to create a flat wash, you want it all to be the same color. So as we're bringing water to our, to our paper, you should be able to pick up your paper. And you see how this raindrop is forming right at the corner of my paper. And if I were to move my paper all the way around, the raindrop stays within the water boundary that I've created, okay? So there's not so much water on this that it's a biodome. I don't have so much water that it's gonna run off. I have just enough water so that there's movement and shine. So as this begins to dry, the paint will move into the paper as the water evaporates slowly in an even way, all right? And that will give you a nice wash. Now, if, you're, if your wash is not moving this, this fluidly, the answer is always adding just a bit more water. Like I said, it does feel very foreign to bring water to paper, um, but if you're using 140 pound weight watercolor paper, I have yet to meet anyone that makes a hole in it. So just add more water and see if you can get that fluid motion, okay? So the next technique that we're gonna cover is uh, wet and wet. And wet and wet is just slang for wet paint in wet paint. So we're gonna start again. Our base is going to be a wet moving wash. This is a great chance to test to see if you're using enough water in your wash because as we add a second layer of paint, it's going to move within and kind of do fireworks, bleed in vain. This is a good example. Both of these are great examples right here. So this and this, are good examples of wet and wet. So you had a wet moving wash that was a, the blush base, and then we dropped in a secondary color that was also wet paint, so wet and wet. And if, you're, if your things aren't moving, I'm gonna teach you how to make it move, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna start out with a wash that's in a lighter color, and you want a lot of movement and shine, okay? And remember, we're working in that soy sauce, wasabi texture, or grabbing. So what you're gonna probably need to do is reanimate your palettes. Make sure your palette is also still moving as you create. Go ahead and get in there. Make sure that there's that raindrop forming if you need it right here for your wash. And then again, we're gonna create a nice wash base. I suggest using kind of a lighter color for this base wash as we're gonna drop in a darker color. So again, we're going to do that base wash in a lighter color. And again, remember a wash is paintbrush to water, paintbrush to your sauce, and then to your paper. However many times it's going to take to get that really good color that you want as your base. And then remember water. Water is going to be defining where your paint moves and how it moves and how it dries. It's gonna smooth your lines. Okay, so look for that raindrop as you tip your paper. Again, if you're, if you're having a flooding of water down below that's just a bit too much water, that's a biodome, it's finding that perfect balance between just enough water and a little bit too much. So this is good movement. So now, continuing with our food analogy, we're going to be accessing a darker color that we're gonna drop in to this paint, letting this technique be wet in wet. So I'm gonna engage a darker color. And like I said, the food analogy, it's a little bit more wasabi. You could almost argue it's a bit more like ranch. All right, so you're gonna take again, that consistency, this new sauce, and you're gonna go water to new sauce and drop it in 
to your wash that's wet. If it starts to blossom and move like this, where it's veining and moving, that means that um, you have enough water in your base. So if you can envision this, this technique is so beautiful when you're creating flowers or petals, you drop in color and then it just blossoms and moves on its own. If yours isn't moving, here's what's happening. You need a little bit more water in your base wash so that the top wash still moves, okay? There's another, there's another reason it might not be moving too. You have to have a decent amount of water in your top wash as well that, of the paint that you're dropping in to make it move. So both need to be wet in order to move, okay? And if it didn't move and it's just kind of sitting there, go ahead and water the whole thing down, create another wash again, get some movement, and then watch it, uh, watch it move out. All right, and the cool thing is too, is you can feed these wet and wet parts right here. You can drop in more color and it only gets more vibrant and brighter the more you drop in. But keep in mind, your bottom wash is starting to dry. So watercolor is always a bit of a race against time. So you can wet your washes down to the point, the reason I like that raindrop is because it gets your wash wet enough that it enables you to drop in paint and gives you time to make change to your watercolor. So if you think about it, if your base wash is starting to dry, you can't drop in more color or add any color gradation because the change isn't gonna be smooth and flowing like watercolor paint. You'll get hard lines, right? So the key is, again, just using a little bit more water Okay, thanks so much for joining me as we walked through some basic uh, fundamental watercolor technique. You've learned about making that magic sauce with your wash and using that wet in wet technique in order to add some really beautiful color gradation for movement and shine. And now we're gonna work together to make this lovely wreath. Uh, as you can see, you've got that movement and shine in some of the leaves and lovely color gradation from greens and blues. We're gonna be using two colors and we're just gonna dive right into this lovely wreath. Here are two different bowl shapes that I like to show. Um, I like to trace a wreath um, not necessarily in a perfect circle, so you can see the gold one was more circular and the white one was just kind of an irregular. Anything you have on hand is great. Uh, these are the black Micron pens that I like to use. Uh, they have waterproof ink. And then here is just a regular HB pencil. Um, I like to have pens and pencils nearby as well as an eraser just so that I can clean up any mistakes. Here's my two brushes. There's a round four and a round one. And like I mentioned in my materials, I like the round because of the versatility of the brush. There's a really small stroke you can make. There's my little eraser and a larger stroke because of that round. And then we're going to be using um, Payne's Gray, the Windsor Newton, um, and then also Oxide of Chromium. We're just going to use two colors and then we're going to mix them. And I've got one piece of paper for my final and one piece of paper for scrap. Um, this little palette was made by a friend, Clay. I just love to have small palettes around that, you know, dinner plates, whatever you have around. Um, I think that that was meant to be a ring dish or for jewelry, but I just think it's so pretty. So I like to have an excuse to use some paint on it. All right, I'm pouring out fresh tube paint. Again, this can be done with um, any type of cake or dried watercolor as well. Um, you just have to wet it a bit more and you have to be aware that the concentration of paint when you use cake uh, watercolors that's already been dried, um, it's gonna be less um, saturation of color. So you're just gonna have to really kind of dig into those cake paints a little bit more in order to get this much saturation. All right, we're gonna create some movement and shine on the palette. Again, we want that movement and shine on the palette before we even go to the paper. I'm just testing out the colors, making sure we've got enough movement on our palette. So that's that Payne's Gray first and then the Oxide of Chromium. Um, because we're gonna be making smaller leaf shapes, we don't necessarily need so much water that we're gonna flood our boundaries, but we want enough again there, so we've got that nice raindrop. 
So you want that magic sauce that about 80% water, 20% paint on your palette. And this is, I'm demonstrating the classic hold. And this is how, what you do not want to do. So do you see how the paintbrush is jutting backwards, kind of following the line of my thumb? And then we're going to do this nice little stroke called the point pressure point. So with the lightest amount of pressure, I'm making access um, to, the, to the paper with my just the point of the brush. And do you see how I increase that pressure right in the center to create the width of the leaf? And then right at the end, I decrease my pressure again. So I like to call this stroke the point pressure point. I would encourage you point pressure point to keep practicing this stroke you can make long leaves short leaves this is a good demonstration of that leaf right there do you see how it's not a lot enough point at the front and the back end so light pressure in the beginning increase your pressure for that width in the brush and then decrease your pressure to finish off that lovely leaf and this is a good reminder also that we have got movement and shine in these leaves. And this is how we're going to add interest to a leaf. Remember, you can make changes to watercolor while things are wet. So go ahead and spend some time creating those point pressure point leaves. Um, you can be really fancy and create a nice uh, vein in between your leaf by using the white of the paper. So that point pressure point, and then that really light amount of pressure to connect the leaf. Again, point pressure point. And when you leave that white of the paper in between your two point pressure point strokes, you get this really just dynamic leaf. And you can slowly build a nice little branch. This is definitely the time to play. So that was all done with the round four brush. And here I'm using the round one brush. I'm combining the two colors, both Payne's gray and the oxide of chromium. And I'm making smaller point pressure point leaves. Uh, keep in mind that when I first started making these leaves, it took me a lot longer. It is okay to move slow. If you um, are familiar with calligraphy, you know that forming those strokes takes time and practice, and eventually your arms and your hands start to communicate with your brain and you develop muscle memory, but it takes a lot of practice. I think my first wreath that I did in this style took me about six hours to get the leaves how I wanted them, um, and now we can whip out a nice little leafy wreath branch in about 20 minutes. So again, it's that practice that creates that muscle memory so that you become more confident in your stroke and your hand begins to understand that beautiful stroke. All right, here I've taken a combination of the Payne's Gray and the Oxide of Chromium. And I like to call this color, when I combine Windsor and Newton, these two colors, I like to call it my Monstera Green. And with these three different colors, we've got the pure oxide of chromium, the pure Payne's gray, and then the mix of the two together with the Monstera, you have three interesting colors that you're going to be able to create a wreath with. So here we're going to take our other piece of paper. I've put my scrap paper aside. I'm still going to access it and practice on it. I'm going to turn my bowl upside down and use my pencil to create a nice circular-ish shape just to give me kind of a guideline with my eyes where I want it to go. It's hard to see, which is intentional. Um, you don't want to have a lot of hard lines afterwards because they're harder to erase. Now I'm going to take my Micron pen and I'm actually going to add some waterproof ink leaves just branching off in irregular patterns off of this round. So our wreath will have watercolor leaves, but it will also have these really fun irregular um, drawn leaves, which just adds interest and contrast. So this is the shape that I'm using. It's kind of a elongated C shape. I'm just going to continue this. Um, notice I'm using just um, the point very lightly, and I usually pull from top to bottom. I feel like I have the most control when I draw, uh, when I go top to bottom. And I'm a regular, making irregular um, lengths. All my leaves are not the same length. And I'm kind of popping around my wreath in no particular fashion. Feel free to follow the same pattern as I am or to go ahead and create your own pattern. If you feel that a leaf should be in a certain place, by all means, go ahead 
and make it there. Um, This is really an invitation to play and to own your own creativity. Um, Part of finding your own style and creating that fingerprint, that unique look of your own piece is listening to that inner voice that says, hmm, maybe a leaf here. Uh, And finding confidence in listening to that voice. Um, And that's how you start to really grow in your own unique styles. When you start to listen to that voice and you like what it looks like. All right, notice that I didn't completely close the circle when I traced it in the pencil because I like wreaths to kind of have this branching look as they come up on the sides, um, which you can complete your circle and make it a complete circle, um, or you can leave it open like I did. Again, it's one of those personal preferences. All right, I've got some fun little leaves. I'm going to cap my micron pen so I save my ink, and we are going to begin. Um, Again, you can practice those point pressure point leaves until you're confident with the leaf shape and you really want it to be a fluid motion. You don't want to have to continually come back. You want to be able to do one leaf and leave it, another leaf and leave it. Again, notice too, as I pull the stroke, it's a top to bottom movement. And I go point pressure point, point pressure point. And I am starting on the outside and bringing the leaf shape in so that the edge of the leaf, the connecting stem, gets close to that circle of pencil so that as I began to do the stem, the vine, that really thin, thin line, they all kind of connect. So I've switched to my round one here to create some smaller leaves and interests. And also notice as I put my paintbrush onto my palette, and I'm making these smaller leaves, I'm using a higher concentration of paint to water ratio. This allows you to have a bit more control. Do you see I'm working closer to that wet dab of paint? Most likely my ratio is more about 50% paint, 50% water as I'm working with the smaller boundaries, or I'm using this um, dabbing method of adding darker paint to the wet leaves. Um, This allows me, again, to just have a bit more control. In my book, Modern Watercolor Botanicals, I talk about how this consistency is closer to a heavy cream. And uh, that first consistency we're working with um, is more of that soy sauce with the touch of wasabi, that 80% water, 20% paint. So we're slowly going to build the wreath as we walk around this nice little wreath. I'm going to be switching in between my brushes, all right? Bigger to little. And remember, you're not on a solid plane here. You can switch things around. You can do leaves on top of your waterproof ink because it's waterproof and you're not going to make it bleed. Um, And that's one really nice thing about adding the ink and the watercolor because you have this interesting texture mix. Uh, So at the end, it looks much more complicated and dynamic. I'm going to throw in some leaves, top and bottom. Notice I don't just work myself all the way around. I kind of pop around and this allows different colors to be in different spots. I've been using mainly Payne's Gray and that mix of Monstera. Now I'm going to kind of go more into that oxide of chromium. And notice I rarely, very rarely work straight out of that fresh tube paint. Again, it's just such a high concentration of pigment. And watercolor is really known for its transparent beauty. So you want to work out of that water to paint mixture that is to the side of the tube paint, that that movement and shine magic sauce that you create. It allows the paint to continue to move on the paper as the water evaporates. You get interesting color and texture. Just continuing to move myself around this wreath, alternating in size, alternating in color, constantly negotiating that magic sauce in my palette to make sure there's movement and shine. Notice I don't access the water too much because I really am working out of that magic sauce that I've created on my palette, but it's very important to keep that magic sauce up on the palette. And if at any point it feels like it's getting a little too gummy or starting to dry out, that's when I introduce a little bit more water from my uh, my little jar of water, my little mason jar of water here. 
Now I'm introducing that point pressure point leaf that has the interesting vein in between where there's that white piece of paper coming through. Again, it just adds that extra element of interest and this is where your creativity can really shine. All right, I'm gonna switch over, go for a smaller brush here. This allows you also to get that interest in size. That round one allows you one to dab in a more concentrated amount of paint. And notice I'm dabbing into the leaves that are still wet. So as the water evaporates, that paint is moving into those small paint boundaries. Each of our leaves are a little wet boundary. And when you look at each leaf as its own tiny masterpiece, at the end, when you observe the piece as a whole, it's really this collection of beautiful little leaves. And it adds so much interest to the eye when you can have different aspects to each leaf. Each leaf is uniquely done. It had so much interest and fun. And here I'm just using, I'm going to show you that texture that I'm using. So you can see there's movement, there's shine, but I'm working out of a more concentrated. I'm almost moving towards a mustard consistency, more of like an 80% paint, 20% water. Again, when you're making these tiny little leaves, you don't really want movement right? You want enough so that the paint is wet. But for those of you that love, of course, we all love Felix's color by Felix's amazing acrylics. Um, if you're working towards that consistency, you're almost working with an acrylic texture as you're drawing this leaf. Acrylic was my first love and it's where I began a lot of my work. Um, and so it's fun to actually work with watercolor in that thicker texture. One, because you have a bit more co color, um, it's that higher concentration. Um, and also because you have a, a bit more control. The paint goes exactly where your paintbrush puts it. Where in watercolor, oftentimes you don't have as much control. So you notice as you do your leaves, your paint moves where your water is wet. And it kind of has its own mind where it tends to hang out in your leaf. You don't have as much control. But when you do use a higher paint to water ratio, there's less movement, but more saturated color and the paint goes where you want it to go. So notice my little uh, vine that I'm drawing around. I'm connecting the edges and it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. And you don't always have to paint it. Sometimes a leaf will go over your vine and you don't necessarily have to continue it. Other ways, there's, do you see how when you look closely, it's not perfectly circular. And really, if you're out in nature and you look at a tree or a nice little branch, you notice that very often is a branch or a stem perfectly circular or straight. So this is a great way for you to mimic nature in that way and to make it look a little bit more natural by adding in interest and not making everything perfect. Notice not all my leaves are facing the same way. All of my leaves aren't the same shape or color. Just slowly taking the process along. I think one of the most beautiful things about painting is the mindfulness it allows. Our bodies are so concentrated on the next shape or the next color, the next paint stroke, that our minds are able to let go of the problems we're constantly circling in our head. Um, <clears throat> I believe Josie Lewis Art, she talks about, um, it's called monkey brain. And what it does is it allows us to let go of the monkey brain and our subconscious is still working it out, sure, but our conscious brain is taking a deep breath and our hands are working and we have slowed our pace down to a paintbrush stroke and it's a very uh, relaxing way to spend our time the monkey brain can go away for a little while so i'm just working my rat way around and notice i've turned my wreath completely upside down i am left-handed and i found that that helps me from dragging my arm through my wet work um i don't tape my watercolor paper down so i find that uh i like to work on a moving plane 
feels a bit more relaxing for me and I don't have to worry about smudges quite so easily. And here I'm actually painting right inside that wet boundary. Um, notice other times I've ignored the ink leaves. This time I just added color inside the ink leaf for interest and difference. And here I've just extended my wreath a slightly longer. I'm just going to add a little bit more, just a few more leaves to make them almost touch. Now when you're painting a wreath like this, um, usually you're pretty close up. You're looking, you'll find yourself very intent on a few leaves. It's important while you're painting to continually pull back and assess where you want your next leaf. And here I'm going to be using the wet on dry technique. A lot of uh, the leaves are already dry. Those wet boundaries have already dried. So I'm going to show you this is what I'm doing. I'm taking a little bit of wet paint and I'm creating a nice fine little leaf line. And it's really beautiful contrast when you use that Payne's Gray or the Monstera dry, almost dry recipe onto a dried leaf. Um, again, it just adds that extra touch of dynamic interest on top of an already dried uh, wet wash leaf. So I'm just going to go around and do some finishing touches to make it look like my unique wreath. I would just encourage you to do these wreaths as often as you'd like. Um, I think they make wonderful cards. Um, people add their initials to it, um, really happy sayings. Um, recently, a gal did This Too Shall Pass, and I felt so, it was so appropriate to the time we're all going through in this strange time. Um, and I would encourage you to use different colors. I really, um, I just wanted to concentrate on these two colors and then that Monstera recipe of the combination for this wreath. But I've done rainbow wreaths. I've done one color and then I water it way down for lighter leaves or use a really he more heavily saturated paint. Um, and then you get this beautiful monotone wreath. You can make it as simple or as complicated as you'd like. It really just becomes a beautiful piece that you can relax. And here I'm pointing out, um, I did run my hand through it at one point and inevitably it's going to happen whether you're left-handed or not. So I wanted to show you how to fix it. So notice I took, I cleared my brush so there wasn't any extra paint in it and by just swishing it along the bottom of my mason jar. And then I flooded that little smudge on my paper with water and I used paper, a paper towel to really just press very hard onto the watercolor paper and it really soaks up that excess pigment so that you don't have any smudges. Now if you did that smudge in the middle of a re your wreath, pull it up as much as you can and once the whole area is dry, go ahead and paint another leaf on top of it and you'll be able to complete it just fine. Thank you so much for joining me for this beautiful little wreath. I cannot wait to see what you create on your own.